Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Welcome uh, to this uh, webinar. My name is um, Kode Finnbach. I'm uh, the Chief Customer Success Officer at Visavi. This uh, webinar will focus on um, Repsol Sinopex usage of uh, Visavi. But uh, before we dive into uh, that topic, a few remarks from my side. Visavi is a cross industry integrated planning and rescheduling solution that facilitates sharing and optimization of plans and activities across disciplines and organizations. We've been working closely with a few companies developing the solution. And with Repsol Sinopec since 2018. To it us, it's a very important relationship. To take us through Repsol Sinopec's experiences with Visavi, we got with us Andrew Birkenshaw and Colin McCarty. They will also be available for questions after their presentation. I leave the word to you, Andrew and Colin. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Kara. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Andy Birkenshaw. Um, I don't know if you can go on to the next slide, Colin, please. Okay, just to introduce ourselves. Um, you may have seen uh, from the flattering pictures uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the webinar, uh, you may have noticed that I'm stood on a golf course. Um, so there will be uh, an extra prize for anybody in the Q&A session that can, uh, can tell me what golf course I'm stood on. And uh, the silly hat that I'm wearing is the clue to the golf course. Anyway, so uh, I'm Andy Birkinshaw, as I said. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the head of operations services at uh, Repsol Sinopec UK. Um, I have many years ago started my career in the oil and gas industry working offshore as a control and instrumentation technician. Uh, since then, I've been involved in uh, a number of different roles across projects, operations and maintenance. Uh, and in 2012, I joined uh, what is now called Repsol Sinopec UK uh, as the maintenance manager, um, responsible for maintenance across 12, 12 sites, um, offshore and uh, an onshore terminal. Um, and uh, I've since then done an asset operations manager's role and a field manager's role. Um, and my current role, I'm responsible for flight and marine logistics, integrated planning, scheduling, work execution, work execution, shutdowns and campaign work management. Thank you, Colin, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thanks, Andy. So uh, I, I report to Andy. I'm the integrated planning manager for Epsol Sinopec UK. Uh, I've worked in the oil and gas industry, industry for around 17 years, mostly within project controls, um, largely within project planning over, over the duration of those years. Um, I've worked with a number of different companies. I've worked with Acker Solutions in the subsea side of the business, building subsea control modules, building uh, SEMs. Um, I then came back over into the top sides, side of the industry, working with AMEC. And through working with them as a service company, I was in a number of operators. So um, uh, three or four different operators in the years leading up to when I joined Repsol Sinopec in 2017. My, um, my primary duties are, as a planning manager are to oversee our medium, long-term uh, planning across our eight operating assets. And I also um, have the process owner for, for work execution. So how we go about identifying, preparing, and ultimately executing scope on the sites. Um, now, Andy will tell you a little bit around the company and how we first met vis-a-vis. -vis. Okay, thank you, Colin. Um... We're just having a bit of difficulty with the video, so you may not be able to see me at the moment, but I'll, uh, I'll continue to try and get my video on. Um, but a little bit about uh, who we are uh, and who Repsol Sinopec UK is. So we're an oil and gas exploration and production company operating in the North Sea. 
the company is a joint venture between Repsol and Sinopec uh, and arose from the acquisition in 2015 by Repsol of the global um, assets of the former Talisman Energy Incorporated. So Talisman was, um, was um, an American-based company with, uh, with the UK assets that are now Repsol Sinopec. Uh, so that includes 51% uh, equity interests in the, in the joint venture previously, as I mentioned, called Talisman. Um, and um, well, so Sinopec, Sinopec originally brought, bought 49% of the UK assets. And then when Repsol bought Sinopec, they became, um, Repsol became 51% owners of the UK um, joint venture. Hence why we're called Sinopec, uh, Repsol Sinopec Resources UK. Um, so our assets include uh, pro producing oil fields and a number of assets that have uh, ceased production or are approaching decommissioning. We're based in Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, we have interest in 48 offshore fields, of which we operate 38 on the UK continental shelf with 11 offshore installations, 10 fixed installations and one floating um, vessel. Uh, and one onshore terminal um, at Flotter, which is a, a, an Orkney island at the very north of, of uh, the UK. Uh, supported by our shareholders, we have long-term commitments to the, to the UK CS. Clearly, as always, um, the safety of our people, integrity of our assets, and prote protection of the environment are always our top priorities. Okay, um, how did we how did we start this relationship with uh, with Visavi? So back in 2018, um, Visavi were at an SP, SPE conference in Aberdeen, um, presenting the the Visavi um, product. Um, they had a stand show, with a large screen showing the solution on the screen, which uh, sparked the interest of uh, of two of our senior um, leaders from our organization that were at the conference. So we had the Vice President of Decommissioning and, and Investment Management and our Head of Maintenance at the time um, was at the, at the conference. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the product demonstration created, uh, created the interest. Um, and after, after, the, um, after the conference, we contacted Oyston to arrange a meeting in Aberdeen, where first and foremost, we wanted a, a, obviously a comprehensive demo and a review and illustration of the benefits of, this, of the tool. Uh, and we were clearly interested in uh, a quote and estimate of the total cost and resources needed for us to implement uh, the solution. So that's really where, that's, that's where the, the relationship started uh, back in 2018. Okay, um, thanks, Andy. So, what we thought would be useful would be just to really talk through the problem statement. So, so why did we think that we needed to uh, engage in a relationship um, with uh, with these of So, um, being in a an industry where we've got uh, where our where our uh, portfolio of assets are offshore, where POB constrained. Um, and flight constraints. So maybe for those of you who aren't who aren't uh, familiar with the term POB, so that's the amount of uh, people we can have on the platform at any one time. Um, the challenges uh, the challenges involved with getting people out to these assets, you know, especially when it comes to to, to weather, um, can be could be pretty difficult. We have poor core team utilization. So in all of our assets, we have a core team. People who are out there with back to backs on a on a rotation on a three week rotation, we um, they are there and ultimately to keep the platform um, running, to keep it safe, and also to help facilitate when we send out vendor driven scopes of work. Um, and ultimately, we we've always found it difficult to fully utilize them. As a result of some of these things, we've tended to have a productive day of around five hours. So again, if, if any of you aren't, aren't familiar with the term, uh, where people offshore work a standard 12-hour day, sometimes they'll do overtime, the productive day talks about how much of those hours do they actually spend on the site with a tool in their hand. And um, at the moment, we're getting around five hours. 
typically the industry standard would be around seven hours and what you know good would look like getting up towards eight hours one of the things that we've suffered is uh, we've got a work management system where we work order what's meant to be all of our work what we find is that that doesn't sometimes happen and um, often when you get to the end of a week and you look at what you should have done the reason for us not achieving that is because we've been working on things that weren't properly identified and then go through our work management process and actually it's it's surprisingly difficult to identify that work on each of the assets we hold uh, what we call ytt meetings yesterday today tomorrow and the premise of these is to have a look at what you should have done yesterday did you do it if you did then close it um, if you didn't do it when are you going to do it what impact is that going to have on your plan for today or tomorrow and when you're looking at tomorrow it's about pr preparedness and readiness are we able to get on with that work do we have what we need to get on with that work we suffered from having unreliable estimates in our work management system and i've seen this through a number of the operators that i've worked with in the north sea um, really your work management system should have years and years of intelligence in it um, often that isn't the case the investment of time that it takes to feedback the learning loop into your work management system um, doesn't actually uh, take place so you could have the wrong estimate for a piece of work you're going to have that wrong estimate every month or every six months or every year that you do that piece of work depending on the frequency of that activity and ultimately with the the age of some of our, our assets um we've got to a place where we have more work than could be done if we don't efficiently execute it um, and this shows up really in in two ways in our in our key performance indicators one is low schedule attainment so we've said we're going to do something in a week how much of it did we actually do um, our corporate target for that is around 90 percent at the moment we tend to uh, float around 80 percent on that so we're around 10 percent off where we would have liked to have been and in fact on some assets We've been down in the 70 70 percent the second um place that you see the impact of us having more work than we can do is in our pm compliance so are we managing to keep up with our maintenance strategy and then of course the risks of not keeping up with it is that your reliability of your plant starts to suffer um, that then has hse implications cost implications affects your, your production numbers uh, it has all kind of all kind of impacts um, and then just to uh, to make it a little bit trickier, at the end of the week, we found it quite difficult to actually understand why they were low. Um, we're talking about hundreds of activities here. It can be difficult to really understand when you get to the end of the week, why did we only achieve a certain amount of what we were meant to do? So these are the uh, challenges that as a company, we were looking for uh, help and a solution um, to, to sort. Okay, thanks, Colin. So, just um, just a, a few words on the vision and what we're trying to achieve um, to to try and improve some of the things that Colin uh, has just described. So, uh, improved uptime through better offshore interaction with the schedule. So, um, our our planning and scheduling team are based onshore. Um, we have a process of of what work we schedule first uh, by priority and criticality. Um, but largely it's down to the scheduler to follow those that process and those rules to put together the, um, the, the schedule that's going to be executed in the future weeks offshore. Um, this it's, The schedule is reviewed offshore, but um, there, there is basically there was limited visibility of that schedule outside a very small group of, uh, of individuals that were intrinsically day-to-day -day looking at the schedule. So better, better interaction with the schedule, which would lead to improved resource utilization. So uh, what we mean by that is, you know, we've got a finite amount of manpower offshore, as Colin said, um, productive day and, and, and the amount of hours we can get out of each person has always been a challenge. But uh, again, we believe through better um, planning and scheduling of the work, we can get uh, more man hours uh, and and more efficiencies uh, by putting together the work more effectively in the schedule. Uh, identify where 
work where, where we are doing work that isn't scoped, um, the invisible work that upsets the delivery of the planned scope. So um, because we have little visibility um, of the work scope that's going on in the week offshore, um, we can't really monitor the things that are, that, that are going on, the break-ins that are happening and the work that people are choosing to do that's not actually in the schedule. And we do have evidence that uh, you know people people have decided that uh, something's higher priority when when maybe with uh, more visibility and more discussion it isn't um, a priority to do in that week or in that day. Uh, better use, visualize core crew resources required to support major capital projects. So um, uh, sort of an ongoing challenge is when we when we've got. Um, a project going on offshore. So that's a piece of work that's not being carried out by the core crew. Um, they very often need the core crew support to, um, to isolate um, um, equipment uh, from the process, electrical systems, mechanical systems for, them, for the project to, uh, to, to be carried out and to be implemented. Uh, and one of the challenges is how do we resource, how do we schedule that core crew resource to support the project as well as doing the core crew work that they're there to, to execute. Again, we, uh, we don't have much visualization of that if the project isn't, isn't um, the, the project work isn't prepped properly in the work orders, then uh, what, what basically happens is the core crew supports the project, don't do the actual schedule, and we've got no idea what they're doing. Uh, similarly, increased visibility of services, so scaffolding, rope access teams, and rigging. Um, obviously, we want to schedule that work. We want to understand what people are doing on a day-by-day -day basis. Maintenance team leader, who's, uh, who's the offshore-based um, team leader uh, for the work execution. Um, we want him to be in control of the whole frozen week. So we need him to be able to see what every, every person in his team is doing if they are supporting uh, projects, if they have got other things that are breaking into the schedule, we need to know about it and we need to reschedule the work or challenge challenge the work that's coming in. So as Colin mentioned, improved scheduled attainment, better ability to understand the change in non-delivery, more opportunity to utilize the space for emergent work or corrective work. So ultimately the vision is uh, to, to, to do more work, get more work completed, uh, in a safe, efficient, and planned manner, with uh, with the same t the same amount of uh, core crew uh, resource that we have today. Thanks, Andy. So um, there, that gives you a bit of a feel for um, what what's going wrong and what we were looking to get um, out of the relationship. So um, rather than going through a kind of a long convoluted uh, explanation of how the implementation went, what we thought was it would be useful to um, just kind of give you a bit of a flavor of how the tool interfaces with our suite of tools um, and gives us a, a visualization. So vis-a-vis -vis interfaces with, with Maximo, which is our work management system, the data that it derives from Maximo is essentially the activity suite that we're going to be doing. We generate work orders for a 180 day window. And at the moment we would be able to, to visualize these, these in uh, in vis-a-vis. -vis. Um, it also interfaces with P6, which is our planning tool. This uh, both supplies and receives any updated dates back from vis-a-vis -vis following any, any optioneering or replanning done in the system. It ties into a system called Vantage. This is, a, I'm not sure if we use it um, uh, elsewhere uh, across Europe, but the, the North Sea use it as a logistics tool. This is a tool that, that uh, tracks all of the flights in the UK um, uh, waters and um, who's on them, the trades of the people who are on that flight, um, what kind of... Uh, whether or not they've done the necessary control of work part, uh, training, all of these kinds of things are held with an advantage. So we have a tie in tie into that system. We also have a tie into our POV trackers. Now the reason that we need this as well as Vantage, Vantage is more around the movement of people. What the POV trackers do is they give us an idea of our capacity. So it, that's more around 
the trade of the person and um, whether or not we can expect to utilize all of that person. So for example, we might have a trainee out there, but we might only um, suggest that they are half a resource, for example, because they are not going to be as productive or as efficient as a as a um, experienced resource. It ties into an Excel shipping schedule. We, we don't really have uh, too intelligent a way to manage our shipping schedule ourselves. We do it in Excel, but uh, regardless, vis-a-vis -vis ties in ties into into that Excel sheet, pulls out when there's going to be um, when there's going to be vessels sailing to our sites. Uh, that just gives a little bit of an indication on, first of all, when people can expect materials, of course. Um, but second, secondly, having a having a vessel in the field could cause an interface or a sim ops with another scope of work. Um, for example, the crane's largely out of use while we're um, decanting materials from the vessel. And we also have visibility of weather forecasting um, within vis a vis. At the moment, this is uh, the weather forecast is coming through, um, is being provided by Visa V, but we're also looking at whether or not we can tie in the weather forecast that we uh, pay for as an organization, Repsol Sinopec Resources, to make sure that the whole business are looking at the same um, weather forecast from the same provider. So that gives you a little bit of an idea how the system is um, providing the information. It's all coming from our systems. There's absolutely no information within Visa V that isn't ours. Um, we have plot plans in there. Um, we have permit. Uh, we have parametry. Um, this is all coming from. This is all coming from our own systems. So, we also thought it would be useful just to give a bit of an indication on what some of the challenges um, we've had in the adoption of the technology. Um, one of the things that we find generally as a business, um, particularly with our offshore uh, fraternity, is a bit of a reluctance to change. A lot of these people have been working on the sites for a long time, or have been working a kind of a set way in the industry for a long time. And a lot of them can be skeptical of new ways of working, which of course we have to try and break those, those barriers. Um, one of the real advantages that Visa V gives us um, in this case is they're using technology that's very familiar to them in the way that they engage kind of in their day-to-day -day lives, things like smart boards, click and drag functionality. These are all the kind of the human interface that we're all using now on smartphones and iPads. Um, and actually not having the information in dozens of spreadsheets or having to go through one schedule that as Andy mentioned earlier, being able to group and sort to navigate the plan um, in a way that is familiar to you um, is really quite powerful. And I think that's a real uh, benefit of that, that visualization. Um, one of the problems that we've got, but we absolutely see vis-a-vis -vis as being a solution to it, is we have multiple ways of working across our assets and not only across our assets, but even across the two rotations within one asset, they have a different way of working. So rather than having, um, rather than having eight different people and teams that we need to align, we really actually have 16. Whereas procedures and processes can do so much of that, but if they're all interfacing with the same tool in the same way, it really makes it very difficult for them to work um, different to one another. And we've already actually um, standardized our organization. Um, so, so this will complement uh, everybody working in the same way and doing things the same way. Um, we've suffered from some naysayers thinking that time in the tools is better invested um, than um, than ultimately planning, because that's the main thing here is that any time that you spend uh, going through through vis a vis and visualizing the scopes, really what you're doing is you're doing fine tuning of of an execution plan. Um, so really, I don't think the arguments ever had much merit, but it's something we've had to battle a little bit. And uh, and lastly, and this is something that Andy and I have worked hard with, there seems to be a tendency to stray to old behaviors in the next rotation. Um, so. You know, we spend a few weeks bedding in vis-a-vis, -vis, becomes part of daily life. They go home for three weeks. They don't think about work at all for three weeks. When they come back, they try and go back to the old way of working that they have for years. And uh, that's been something we've been we've been quite careful to try and to try and battle. And of course, once they've been doing it for a couple of rotations, that becomes the new the new normal. So, um, where are we now? How's it actually worked? 
So what we've done is we split the results down into two different um, categories. We've got tangible results and we've got intangible results. So I'll talk you through some of the tangible results first. Um, and these are really where we've got measurable benefits. So the first one, and uh, probably the most, the most valid one, is our schedule attainment increase. So um, you can see here a very clear increase through from 65%, which was, uh, which was a bad week, but you can see there in September 2020, right through to towards the end of last year, where we um, increased back up close to our corporate target of, of 88%. So a very quick and very immediate um, improvement in our schedule attainment. And this ultimately means that when we say we're going to do something in a week, you know, we go out and we do nine of those 10 things. So that's a real, a real big step forward. The other thing that we've seen as well, and actually tool time can be quite sensitive to a number of different factors, but we have seen a tool time increase here. Um, so you can see there direct normal time percentage increasing from around 55% of their time, which would be um, just slightly over a six hour productive day, but we've plenty of weeks where, um, where that's actually below five up to around 70%, which means that we're starting to see seven or eight hour uh, productive days on the site that we, we trialed the use of vis-a-vis. -vis. So um, some real measurable improvements there, but actually just as important as these are some of the, um, the, the less tangible benefits that we've uh, realized and uh, Andy will talk through those. Okay, thank you, Colin. So yeah, as well as uh, the the obvious benefits that we've seen from the tool so far, uh, there are some some benefits that we uh, that we didn't expect to see uh, immediately. So um, one of them, the work order closeout. So we do a, a YTT, a yesterday, today, tomorrow meeting um, every day. Uh, and we now utilize Visavi to identify by exception which jobs have not been closed out. So what this is doing is driving improved behaviors to close out the work orders by task, which then gives us the history uh, and gives us the data to continuously improve. So we've seen, uh, we've seen that in, improve uh, with the use of the tool. Uh, increased visibility. So we have an onshore um, integrated operations center. Uh, where a number of, uh, uh, of people monitoring uh, on a daily basis the execution of work production um, using digital tools uh, and offshore leadership have now much more visibility uh, to ensure that value adding work is included in the schedule, as I mentioned earlier. So this was only previously visible to the, to the schedulers, so now it's, uh, it's available to the whole organization if, uh, if we want them to see it. Uh, improved break-in management, so the ability to react much quicker to unplanned events uh, or in-the-week changes. For example, as a result of pro poor productivity, maybe weather delays or incorrect work preparation. Uh, this is a, as a result of all relevant information to deal with the change being contained in one central area. So we can now see, we can now move um, work orders in, in vis -a vis uh, to a place where we've got either a dip in the uh, resource, um, so the resource has got more hours to, to execute that work, or we can move it into future weeks, uh, and then it will then go through an approval route in vis-a-vis -vis and update our work management system, Maximo. So an example of this being uh, the core team being directed recently to an incident we had uh, offshore um, an emergent issue uh, in March, um, and the core crew was redirected to respond to to, uh, to a breakdown of a piece of equipment. And Visavi then allowed us to um, efficiently update the rest of that frozen schedule, uh, the week schedule, uh, and we could do that uh, immediately. We don't have to wait to the end of the week or the end of the month to see our schedule attainment uh, is uh, is low and the reasons for it. Uh, process improvements, so known deficiencies in our in our processes and data are highlighted by vis, -vis. So again, driving continuous improvement and our adherence to the work execution process. 
So we have sort of, um, I would say, uh, a standard best in class process uh, to execute work through from identifying work through to the planning, scheduling and execution of the work. But actually, um, what we've seen now with the use of vis a -vis, that our the data in Maximo, the work, the planned work orders, uh, the data quality is not as good as it could be. So the hours pretend to be uh, incorrect or we don't have the right tasks on the work orders. Uh, and this now gives us the opportunity to see that, uh, see that immediately uh, and make the changes and interventions for the next time. So again, continuous improving um, our data standard within, within the Maximo system. Uh, an improved schedule attainment and compliance means we're ultimately completing more work with the same people, as I mentioned earlier. One of the other things that's not on, on the slide, but uh, uh, we're convinced we are seeing an improvement, obviously, through is, is HSE improvements and, and cost benefits. So um, it's quite difficult to put a number on it so far because um, you know we're dealing with uh, individual work orders. Uh, on one asset, typically we are scheduling three to 400 work orders a week. So um, although it's difficult to say how much cost saving we're saving on each one of those, cumulatively, more hours, more, more hours a day, productivity, get more work done with the same people, absolutely ultimately means where uh, the efficiency of the platform is going up. Um, and the cost to do that is, is coming down um, or, or improving. So on the last slide, um, where, where do we go from here? So as we mentioned, we've got several assets in our portfolio. portfolio. We've rolled out vis a -vis to one of our uh, key assets uh, over a year ago now, and you saw the, the, the gradual improvement uh, in the um, schedule attainment that Colin showed on that asset. Um, so we did roll out that asset as a trial to see uh, to see how it would be adopted and the benefits that, uh, that we would get from the tool. Um, we're now convinced that it is going to help uh, and improve our work execution process. So we're now rolling out to another five of our operated assets. Uh, then with a view to um, having a look at some of our assets that are post COP, um, and we'll we'll consider rolling it out across uh, across those assets where um, you know some of those assets are not producing anymore, but uh, are still manned, so we're still maintaining the the platforms. Um, so not not as critical that uh, you know, some of the critical equipment is, is maintained uh, at a schedule, at, at a frequency, because we've got no hydrocarbons on board, but we still think there's a benefit, obviously, from, uh, from better planning, preparation, uh, and scheduling of work. OK, um, I think that comes, brings us to the end of the slides. I don't know if we've got any questions. Yes, it's uh, quite here again. Uh, a few questions, yes. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on uh, the key uses of vis-a-vis? Uh, -vis? Yeah, I mean, I can I can take that one, Andy, if you want, and then um, you can okay. you can you can jump in. So the key uses uh, the way the way that we apply the tool. I mean, I, Cara can probably talk about the way it can be applied in other in other arenas, but the way that we use it is on a daily basis. <clears throat> we have a team of our offshore management. They will sit down and they will look. You look at yesterday. They will look at today, and they will look at tomorrow. They navigate around a plot plan of the platform, and they're able to very quickly, um, very able to very quickly group and sort by the trade. So they would be able to look, for example, exactly exactly where elect, where they're going to have electrical scopes the next day, in what area. They're able to have a look and see when resources are coming out on the flights. So be able to see when vendors are coming out. They're able to see if there's any impact from the weather on those scopes. And ultimately they can then click and drag activities. If it's not going to be done on a Tuesday morning, is it going to be done on a Thursday afternoon? And then you start to paint a picture and can start to improve your recovery from that change. So, so ultimately our onshore organization identify that work needs to be done. They prepare it. 
we send it to offshore to be executed. In the past, as Andy mentioned, trying to navigate around that information, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of individual items. If you, as a supervisor or as, a, as an offshore leader, can very quickly navigate around that scope and understand synergies, risks, and be able to feedback changes in week to try and uh, drive a recovery, it's really powerful. Yeah, and then in terms of who who uses the products the most, uh, who uses vis a -vis, um, we do use smart boards. So we have smart boards onshore uh, and offshore. We encourage uh, the discipline supervisors, so the mechanical, electrical, and instrument supervisors to, uh, to, to use the system, use the smart boards. They can stand up around the smart boards as a team. They can move the work orders about. They can look at different scenarios of, of how they're going to do the work. Uh, together, so it tends to be the supervisors that take ownership of their of the schedule while they're in execution offshore. Uh, the maintenance team leader now uses it, as we mentioned, to do uh, to facilitate the daily meeting. Uh, and the OIM has now taken a keen interest in uh, in the schedule uh, and what what work uh, we said we were going to do, and what have we achieved, and what haven't we achieved. So offshore tends to be from supervisor level upwards, mm -hmm. uh, and the supervisors then manage the team, um, the, the daily work that the team are doing. And then onshore, um, in our, our onshore uh, operations center, uh, we have discipline engineers supporting each discipline offshore. Uh, we have the scheduler and the planner, uh, and, the, and those are the key people onshore that, uh, that then start to use, use the system on a daily basis. Uh, that, that's right in the uh, having multiple licenses for a tool like Primavera and trying to have 20 30 people feeding into a schedule just isn't going to be realistic this is a way through one um, visualization tool that people can make and propose changes they can be reviewed before they're incorporated back into the plan very interesting uh, another question um that's uh, come in here. Uh, can you give an example of HSSE improvements achieved? Yeah, maybe maybe I can help with this. Um, so uh, I think Colin mentioned earlier in the system we've got plot plans of of the of the asset of each level, each area of the assets offshore. Um, because there's a link to our permit system, it's very easy to visualize what works going on in each area. So if a, if a work order in vis, -vis is scheduled uh, on a particular day in a particular area, um, it shows up in that area on the plot plan and so does the permit. So we can, we've got a very quick, easy um, visualization of, of cumulative risk in an area by what activities are, are being done in the area. And actually when we're doing the scenario planning within vis, -vis you can then separate that work by time um, so obviously, if you, you don't want to do a lifting operation while you're doing some work uh, below it, so we can separate uh, that work by, by time horizons. Uh, and it's very easy and very, very visual to do that. So mm. that's probably a pretty good example of a, a HSSE benefit. Okay. Another question, how was the expectations of the, the demo or the proof of concept versus the end result? Well, I think I think probably the best answer to that is we've managed to put through a business justification to roll it out across another four assets. So um, it certainly addressed the issues um, that uh, we were looking to address. We still got improvements to make. What is interesting, actually, and I think Andy touched on this, is not only did it start to uh, help us address the issues and concerns we had, it actually identified the root cause for those, which is another suite of things that we need to fix. Um, and these have only really been been uh, been visible because of the use of the system. We absolutely were drowning in information before, um, and the tool is helping us make that a little bit clearer. Okay, and another one um, uh, following the same track, so to speak. How do you calculate the time or the tool time percentage result? Are the data capacity planned? Or, sorry, here, let me see, it disappeared. 
It's okay, I can I can see it, Cara. Um, Very good. Yeah, so um, to answer it, so there's a, probably a couple of questions in there. I'll try and I'll try and go through. So our productivity pr uh, percentage result is based off of we have a we have a tool um, totally separate to vis a vis where we book our um, where we book our time uh, to the work orders. So our our um, the productivity productivity improvement is where we see people spending more of their day on a direct work order rather than to an indirect code. So you're never going to reach twelve hours because people need to have their lunch. They need to go to time out for safety talks. They need to go to the toilet. There's a number of different things that they need to do. Unfortunately, we can't fix that. I don't think. Um, but uh, certainly, um, what we're seeing now is that more of the day is spent actually doing. Um, doing direct work. Um, as for the data, so our resource capacity, how many people we have out there, that comes from our POB tracker. So that's telling us that we have five mechanical technicians, four electrical technicians. Um, and then the resource usage, so the actual plan, um, the forecast, and what we eventually do is coming from Primavera. So that says that tomorrow, ultimately, in the tool, we could see that we've got five mechanical technicians, but we've got work for six. Therefore, there's something that we need to smooth. Very good. Uh, another question. Um, what uh, was required or is required regarding training and uh, uh, how long does it take or did it take before you started to see results? Yeah. Hello. Uh yeah i'll 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 touch on um on the training so we the system um the system is pretty intuitive and uh as colin mentioned earlier all the data in the system is our data so people people recognize the codes that we're using they recognize the terminology that we're using in the system so it then tends to be really just a, a navigation around the screens um we did uh, we did involve one person from offshore as a like a super user um, and that one person did the rollout uh, and the training so we didn't do any formal class classroom training we didn't think it was necessary we still follow our same processes and procedures we haven't changed any 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 way we do work or prioritize work it's now just a visualization um, a different visualization uh, tool so um, as the system is quite intuitive, we, we didn't do any formal, formal training. Um, it was done across teams uh, remotely uh, with one person um, rolling out to group sessions. Um, and I think once you start using the system, um, people, it didn't take them very long at all to actually start using the product. Um, I think the key thing was what Colin mentioned earlier was the... Uh, the behavior change uh, and the belief that Big Brother's watching what, you, what we're doing now all the time. Once we once we got over that hurdle, supported the guys and 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 you know told them why why we're using the system, what we're trying to achieve with the system. The adoption was pretty quick, to be fair. Um, and as soon as they start using the system, understanding the system, and see its benefits, uh, it kind of snowballs from there. Very good. I think uh, you partially answered this, but um, regarding uh, the smart boards, uh, how do you best utilize them and uh, who are using them most? Yeah, the, the smart boards. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got smart boards linked up across, across the network between on and offshore. Um, so, and we've got collaborative areas onshore and offshore that, uh, that we, we have the smart boards installed in. So um, it tends to be uh, the daily meetings. So offshore, onshore can sit in on the daily meetings and, and ask questions um, uh, using the smart board. We can move work orders about. So you stand up and just drag and drop a work order across the screen. Um, you can create a different planning scenario live on the screen that we can share between on and offshore. And it tends to be, you know, a group of people stood around this, this, the smart board offshore. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, supervisor level, um, work preparation, um, onshore and offshore. Very good. 
A question regarding uh, the uh, implementation phase. Did you face any challenges in that phase in terms of interacting with the legacy systems uh, for the different disciplines? So my, uh, neither Andy or I were that close to the implementation, but my memory of it, or of my, my third party view on it, because I was in the company at the time, was um, that it wasn't overly painful. One of the challenges now, we're going through implementation on the second asset now, as, as we've discussed, and what our biggest challenge in an organization has been engaging our IT in the process. So um, the most likely scenario that we will come up against is actually that we hold up vis-a-vis -vis in, um, in the implementation of the, of the, of the, of the project. Um, we are more likely to become the critical path now, whether all organizations would suffer that or not, I don't know. But, uh, but, but, but honestly, that's the main, um, the main challenge we've had thus far. I think the, the, um, the challenges of rolling it out to the, to the asset, we've, dis we've discussed probably quite a bit, but implementation wise, um, I think uh, it's quite important to treat any of these types of rollouts like any other project to have a PEP and to understand exactly what is expected of all of those involved. And that includes the, uh, the, the, the customer probably as well as vis-a-vis. As -vis. Okay. And another one, uh, have you experienced, um, uh, or how was the access to the uh, cloud infrastructure uh, offshore? Have you experienced any problems uh, in that connection or how does it work? Uh, I've not heard of anybody struggling to use a system, Andy. Have you? I think it's been it's been it's it's coped. Um, I know there's a lot of data transferring back and forth, but I can't think of a time that anybody hasn't managed to access the system, or that it's that it's hung up, or that it's dropped information. Yeah, no, I think I think because it's not it's not data intensive across the link, uh, and we do have decent offshore um, bandwidths. Um, no, I, I, I don't think we've experienced any issues using the system in terms of bandwidth. Okay, and then I've got a uh, final question for you here. Uh, how do you feed back data to the work management system? If you see better other ways to do things when you simulate changes in vis-a-vis? -vis? So um, ultimately what happens is when somebody goes through the replan process, they click and drag, and process that Andy's described. So um, a group of guys are standing around looking at um, the plan that's been prepared by Onshore. Perhaps Onshore haven't fully understood the uh, the state of the plant or the access to the scope of work, whatever. It could be any of a thousand things, really. And they then do the click and drag replan option to try and make the plan more representative of, of what's going to happen or to optimize it. It then goes into essentially a bucket that we, you can assign a approver. And in our case, that's an MTL. It could just as easily be an onshore person. It could be a planner. Um, at that point, you have the opportunity to essentially reject or accept those changes. Those then get written back into the dates, get written back into Primavera. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, oh, no, sorry, and ultimately the way that our systems work it then goes from Primavera back into the work management system, the scheduled dates. But uh, if you were using the plan and functionality within your work management system, it would write directly back into, you know, Maximo SAP, whatever it was you were using. Okay. Uh, I said it was the last, but uh, there are a couple of new questions that um, I think we have time uh, for. Okay. Uh, if fully agreed, it's one comment first here. I fully agree with all the points you put up on challenges in adoption. But how do you convince your team, especially offshore team, that vis-a-vis -vis is a great tool for the future? Well, we, we actually um, <clears throat> learned a little bit from the trial where we did have a little bit of, a, of difficulty um, uh, selling the product to the users. And the benefit that we had the second time round was that we had some tangible results. You know, we've seen that things have been done better. And of course, it's very difficult to defend uh, not using it if the results aren't great. You know, if you're not doing things very well, um, it, I think it does make it quite difficult to defend. Um, so the way that we've challenged, um, the way that we challenged 
the second asset, or in fact, it's actually the third asset we're going to roll the two light one, is we went direct to the OIM. You heard Andy talking about um, our offshore installation managers. So everybody who's on the plant works for that person. They're ultimately responsible for the safe and, and efficient functioning of, of, of that asset. We showed him the tool. We showed him the results from the trial. And he actually knocked himself up from being fourth or fifth in line to have the tool to be in third in line. Um, so that shows that not only are we actually getting engagement, um, we're actually getting, um, uh, not only are we getting interest, we're actually getting engagement as well. Now, the reason that I mention that is because ultimately, if all else fails and you don't get the workforce engaged, then we have the OIM on our side to make it a tell. But ultimately, you still want to go in there, show the functionality, and uh, and sell it, and especially it's it's ease of use. You know, and we've talked about um, how easy it is to navigate around it. We have an age demographic, um, but I don't think we've come across anybody yet um, who would struggle to use a tool. And actually, going back to an earlier question, I would be so bold to say that somebody could probably use a tool um, within half an hour <laughs> of uh, using it, um, as long as they're familiar with the the, the data feeds. You can navigate around vis-a-vis um, -vis and find it useful within within twenty or thirty minutes. Yeah, one one other thing we did actually to uh, help with the rollout and the challenges was we took one of the offshore people from that asset uh, into the team, and he was the one that mentioned did the rollout. So immediately there was some uh, some recognition um, and some you know, some confidence that, uh, that the guy rolling it out had an offshore understanding, had an offshore head, um, and and then demonstrate the benefits to them. That's uh, that's basically all we had to do. Very good. Then I think uh, we close the question and answer session. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, uh, answers. No, not at all. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Cara. Yeah, thank you very much. Hope it was useful. I believe so. Thank you very much, both of you, and also to uh, you attending uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, if uh, you uh, have more questions uh, or want a demo or uh, more information about the vis a vis, you find the information here, the contact information. We are, of course, more than happy to answer any questions you got or any requests for a demo or uh, more information about our solution. Thank you very much, everyone.